All right, let's open uh, to Romans chapter 5 once again. So we've been uh, started on Romans 1 and have just been picking out a few verses in each chapter that uh, I believe are relevant to what we're talking about. So last week, we spent much of the time on Romans 5, 9, where it talks about us uh, being saved from wrath through him. So I want to begin this evening in Romans chapter, the next verse, Romans chapter 5 and verse 10. So Romans 5, 10 says, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So. Um, if we, we looked briefly, briefly last week, but if you look again at verses 6, 8, and 10, those are verses that we should always keep in mind regarding our con condition before we were justified by faith. So if you look again at 6, 8, and 10, we were without strength, we were ungodly, we were sinners, and we were enemies. And then uh, we'll come right back, but look at Titus chapter 3. And this is another good verse on this subject. Uh, Titus chapter 3, and Gene Gross, would you read verse 3? Titus, Titus 3, 3, right? Yep. Sorry. You got it quicker than I did. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. So there's another rather unflattering description of uh, who we were, what we were like before we were justified by faith. And then uh, you can go back again to Romans 5. So there, there are many people who like to view the, the unsaved, um, including themselves, before, before they were justified by faith, as being basically good and pretty nice people. Not, not quite perfect, but pretty good. So I, I couldn't tell you how many times I heard growing up heard people say, well, no, nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect, but I believe people are basically good. So when you look at, for example, these verses in Romans 5 or the verse we just read in Titus 3, that certainly is not God's viewpoint to think that, that we were basically good or that people are basically good. Uh, again, it says we're enemies of God. So enemies of God are not basically good or nice people. So there, there are millions of people who go to church regularly, give money to the church, have been water baptized, and, uh, and may, may be nice to you, but in fact, they're enemies of God. So God has many religious enemies. And uh, so that's, that's where we were before we were justified by faith. Notice also in Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, Again, the phrase much more. So I, I talked last week about how that's that's a bit of a theme in this chapter is, is much more. So he begins the chapter right away talking about how we have peace with God and a standing in his grace and so forth. And, uh, and then as you go through the chapter, it's much more, much more. And so again, you see that in, uh, in verse 10. So if Christ died for us, and we were reconciled to God when we were his enemies, how much more will he save us now that we are reconciled? Um, if you look at verse 10, um, as in verse nine, which we talked about last week, again in verse 10, Paul is speaking of, of a future salvation. So in verse nine, he says, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And now in verse 10 again, he says, we shall be saved. So the, the salvation um, in verse 9 clearly is from his wrath, as we talked about last week. The salvation in verse 10 is referring to our glorification in heaven. And verse 10 says that this salvation comes by his life. So uh, 
we we uh, if we sorry for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled we shall be saved by His life. Now that word talks about us being saved by His life. That's not referring to the life that Christ lived when He was on Earth. He, the life that He lived when He was on Earth didn't save anyone. So no one is saved by having Christ as an example. In many churches, they would teach you that, that our salvation is to look at Jesus as our example and then, and then try day by day, try to become more like him, become more and more Christ-like. And, and they teach that's our salvation, but that is most definitely not our salvation. There's no salvation until Christ died, until he shed his blood. Uh, and so the life in verse 10, where it says that we're saved by his life, is referring to Christ's resurrection life, not, not the life that he lived when he was on earth. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and Richard, would you read verse 14? Okay. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So again, it's, it, I'm sorry. Um, so it's again, it's, it's his resurrection life that will save us at his coming. Uh, and then look in Hebrews. Um, notice also in uh, verse 14, it says, um, even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So notice that bring with him. Okay, then Hebrews chapter 13 and Dick, would you read verse 20, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. You know, these buttons pushed here. <clears throat> okay, Hebrews 13. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, Okay, so this verse tells us that God the Father brought the Lord Jesus from the dead. And we just read in 1 Thessalonians 4 that he will bring us with him at his coming. Uh, and, and he will do that, again, through his resurrection life. Then turn to Romans chapter 1. <coughs> Romans chapter 1, and Sally, would you read verse 4? Okay. And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Okay, so Christ's resurrection was a demonstration of the power of God. And we also will be raised with that same power of God. So it's in that sense that we will be, um, that Romans 5.10 speaks of us being saved by his life. So uh, regarding our topic at this time, so wherever we are at any given point in heaven or in earth, Again, there's no chance that the wrath of God is going to be poured out on us because uh, as Romans 5, again, 5, 9 says we, we're saved from, we shall be saved from wrath. And 5, 10 says that we shall be saved uh, through his, through, by his life. And again, that's his resurrection life. All right, then uh, back in Romans 5 and verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So despite all the blessings that he's already mentioned in chapter 5, 
there's still more. And so when you come to verse 11, it says, and not only so. So it's not only all the blessings that he's already mentioned, but there's even more. In, uh, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 11, where the King James says, by whom we have now received the atonement, the NIV says, uh, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So they changed the word atonement to the word reconciliation. And you can look at many translations and, uh, and also see what the, what the scholars say. And you will find that many of them claim that the King James uh, translators made a mistake here in verse 11, that the word should not be an should not be atonement, that that's an erroneous translation, but the word should be reconciliation. So let's talk about that for a moment. First of all, if you look in the, the dictionary definition of the word atonement means agreement, concord, reconciliation. So in the dictionary definition, um, one of the definitions for the word atonement is the word reconciliation. Um, I, I've sometimes heard a lot, a lot of the cute, clever cliches that Christians use are either not true or they're at least a little misleading or unclear. Um, one I kind of like, though, is I've heard people define the word atonement as being at one minute. So if you just look at the word and divide it up, at one minute. And I think that actually is a pretty good definition, pretty good way to, to uh, keep in mind the, the meaning of the word atonement. Now turn to Leviticus chapter 16. So did the King James make a mistake in translating it atonement? And uh, so first of all, we've already seen in the dictionary, one of the one of the definitions it gives for the word atonement is reconciliation. So then even if the, even if reconciliation would be a better word, you can't really say atonement is a mistake then. Um, but then in Leviticus chapter 16, and I will begin reading in verse 16. And so as I read these verses, um, notice the word atonement. So, uh, Leviticus chapter 16, verse 16. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And, so, and now notice verse 20. And when he hath made an end of what? An end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congreg congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. So repeatedly in these verses, it speaks of an atonement being made. But then in verse 20, it says that when they completed all of this regarding making the atonement, they had made an end of reconciling. So clearly, as you look at this passage, um, atonement and reconciliation are synonymous, not only in the dictionary, as we've already seen, but also in the word of God. So again, even if you say in Romans 5.11 that reconciliation would be better, you can't say atonement is wrong because it's synonymous with the word reconciliation in the dictionary and also as we've just seen in the scriptures. Um, so that's 
the starting point. It's, it's clearly not an incorrect translation. But then I, I believe we can go further than that and argue that it, in fact, is a better word. Uh, the word atonement is a better word in Romans 5.11, superior to the word reconciliation. Um, and a couple of reasons for that. The, the word atonement not only carries a similar idea as the word reconciliation, but the word atonement also carries the idea of expiation or satisfaction. And so the, the word atonement tells us that there was a death, there was bloodshed, for the satisfaction of the justice of God. And the word reconciliation does not so clearly tell us that. So in, in Romans 5.11, that word atonement tells us why we are able to join in God. And it's because God has been satisfied by the death of his son. The, the penalty has been fully paid. So expiation has been made, and uh, again, God is fully satisfied. So the word atonement, um, that's one reason it's actually a, a better word to use in Romans 5.11. Um, and the, the use of the word atonement in, in verse 11 closes this section of Romans chapter 5 with a reference to the cross, to the atonement that was made as being the source of all of our blessings. So again, the word atonement is not only, not only is it not incorrect, it's actually superior. And then furthermore, the, the use of the word atonement in verse 11 makes an important distinction for us between Israel and the church, the body of Christ. And the word reconciliation does not make that clear distinction. So if you look at Romans 5.11 once again, it says that we now have the atonement. But then look in Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, and Sharon, would you read verse 19? Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Okay, so notice uh, Peter clearly here is talking to the men of Israel. And he says, be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So clearly that's the second coming. So. Israel's day of atonement has not yet occurred. Israel does not yet have her atonement. Israel will not get her atonement until the second coming. And then uh, also look in Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, and would Dan or Lisa read verses 26 and 27 in Romans 11? And so all Israel should be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the liberator that shall turn away the godliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Okay, so it says all Israel shall be saved. So this is a future thing. Um, and then he says in verse 26, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer. So that's the second coming. And then verse 27, this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. So when will Israel's sins be taken away? Again, at the second coming. That's Israel's day of atonement. So if you go back to, uh, again, to Romans chapter 5. And so this is, a again, a clear distinction, um, an area where we need to rightly divide the word of truth between Israel and the church, the body of Christ. So in the body of Christ, as verse as Romans 5.11 says, we now have the atonement. But as we just saw, Israel is waiting for her day of atonement. 
that will take place at the second coming of Christ. Uh, and one other thing before we move on to the next verse, I want to make it clear that um, what I just said, I'm not, in, in the verses that we just read in, in Acts 3 and, and in Romans 11, that's not speaking about atonement or forgiveness of individual Israelites. That's talking about atonement or forgiveness for the nation of Israel. The individual Israelites, as we talked about, especially in the last couple of weeks, they already have their forgiveness of sins. So we talked about, if you look in Romans chapter 4, and verse 3 says, For what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. It doesn't say it, it will be or it shall be, but it was counted unto him for righteousness. And then verse 4, 5, and then verse 6, he talks about David. And uh, in verse 7, David says, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is a man to whom the Lord will not impute sins. So David's sins were already forgiven. He's not waiting for God to forgive his sins individually. So that's another important distinction to make. So the, the day of atonement is when Israel as a nation will receive forgiveness. And that's what Acts 3 and Romans 11 are talking about. All right, then uh, back in Romans 5. Romans 5, and uh, would Dan or Laura read verse 14, Romans chapter 5, verse 14. Romans 5, 14, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Okay, so notice in verse 14, he's talking about a period of time from Adam to Moses. So, of course, that would be before the law was given. And so, um, if you look at verse 13, in verse 13, we, we see that sin, sin was not imputed before the law. But now verse 14 tells us that even though sin was not imputed from Adam to Moses, there was still a negative effect of sin even before the law. And, and we know that because we see in verse 14 that death reigned from Adam to Moses. Uh, some people have referred to Genesis chapter 5 as the graveyard of the Bible. And if you, uh, if you re remember that chapter or uh, look, look at it later, you'll see it, it's a sort of genealogy, but repeatedly it says, and he died, and he died, and he died. So when we read uh, those chapters in scriptures from from Genesis 3, where Adam sinned, until Exodus, the end of Exodus 19 or the beginning of 20, where the law is given. Those In those scriptures, we should always have in mind as we're reading those, that a prominent thing in that age was that death reigned. So even before the law, death reigned. Uh, turn to chapter 8 in Romans. So if we're making a, an outline, um, that sort of thing, about the different time periods in the Word of God and, and what's prominent about each time period, that period Adam to Moses, the thing that's prominent is that death reigned. Okay, uh, Romans chapter 8, and Meg, would you read verse 2? Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life in in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. So notice the mention of the law of sin and death. So sin always brings corruption. It always brings death. And then look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1 and Aaron, would you read verse 15? And 
when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Okay, so sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So again, sin always brings destruction and death. Okay, and then back in Romans chapter 5. So from, uh, and again, looking at verse 14. So from Adam to Moses, death was not a punishment for the violation of a specific command of God. So that's what he's talking about when he says uh, in verse 14, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. So what was Adam's transgression? Adam was given a very specific command not to eat of the fruit of that tree. And he disobeyed and ate of the fruit of that tree. The others in, in that time period from Adam to Moses were not given specific commands like Adam was. And so that's what it talks about. It wasn't, uh, they didn't sin after the similitude of Adam's transgression. But nevertheless, they all faced death. Um, and because sin, as we've seen, always brings forth death. So sin was a consequence that came upon all men due to Adam's sin. And so even though they didn't have the law, death reigned. Um, so that, that phrase in Romans 5.14, from Adam to Moses, again, that covers the time in the word of God from when Adam sinned in Genesis 3 until the law is given, um, again, at the end of Exodus 19 near the beginning of Exodus 20. So in that time period, again, the prominent thing that we should notice as we're reading those scriptures is that death reigned. Um, Romans chapter, uh, if, if you uh, go look back again in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, it says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. So again, from Adam to Moses, they didn't have the law, so they didn't break the law. But nevertheless, as it states in verse 6, they were ungodly. And they were without strength to, to overcome sin and to overcome the, the result of sin, death. And so again, death reigned. Um, and then, but in... Uh, in verse 6, again, it says, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And so that's how uh, Abel and Enoch and Noah and all of those who lived before the law, that's how they could be saved or how they could be justified. Um, look in Romans. We've talked about this verse quite a lot in the past, but Romans chapter 3. And Dominic, would you read verse 25? Romans chapter 3, verse 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Okay, and so again, the sins that are past here is talking about before the cross. And so at the moment, we're talking even before the law, um, God, through his forbearance, was able to justify, um, again, Adam, Enoch, Abel, Noah, so forth, um, justify them by faith. Okay, then uh, in Romans 5, let's go down to verse 17. So Romans chapter 5, and uh, would Bonsinger Joyce read verse 17? For if by one man's obtain, death reign by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Okay, so again, Paul says that death reigned from Adam to Moses. And now verse in verse 17, he speaks of reigning in life. Um, so if by one man's offense, 
death reigned by one, and of course that would be Adam's offense, much more, so there's again that phrase, much more, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. And of course, the one there is Jesus Christ. Um, and so in, in verse 17, um, if you notice, Paul concludes quite a long parenthesis, begins in verse 13, and it continues all the way until the end of verse 17. So in verse 17, again, notice that phrase, shall reign in life. So just as death began to reign through Adam's offense, so also when the gift of righteousness is received, the recipients reign in life by Jesus Christ. So the, the reigning here in verse 17 is in contrast to having death reign over you, again, as it did from Adam to Moses. So having death reign over you means that you are under the ultimate control of death, or your life is in the sphere or the realm of death. But now in verse 17, we see that we can reign in life through Jesus Christ, so that means that now life is ultimately in control of us. We're, we're in the sphere or the realm of, of life rather than in the sphere or realm of death. So if there was a reign of death, which there was from Adam to Moses, then there's also a reign of life. And uh, so again, that's what verse 17 is, is telling us about. Um, and notice, I notice also in this section in Romans 5 where ta Paul talks about death reigned and then we reign in life by Jesus Christ. Paul doesn't say anything here about us reigning over a piece of land. So again, that was a promise to Israel that they will reign over a piece of land. But Paul doesn't say any such thing for us. He, he says that we will reign in life. All right, and then Romans chapter five, once again, and George, would you read verse 20? So Romans chapter five, verse 20. Moreover, the law entered, law entered that, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Okay, so Paul has just taught uh, that, that before the law, sin was in the world, as he says in verse 13. And then in verse 14, before the law, death reigned. So now he goes on to talk about what happened when the law entered. In, so the, the, there's already a world of sin and death before the law. So then what happened when the law entered? So again, Paul first deals here with the period from Adam to Moses. And now when we come to verse 20, he's dealing with the period from Moses to Christ. Um, and I, I believe he's talking there from, from when the law was given to Moses until we come to Paul to Christ's appearance to Paul. So that's the second period here. So first is Adam to Moses, death reigned, and then from Moses to Christ. And so um, the, the law was, so, so this is again the time, from the time that Moses received the law in Exodus 19 or 20, until Christ appeared to Paul with the gospel of grace. Um, turn to Acts chapter 2. Now, some would take this period um, from Moses to Christ as either the birth of Christ or uh, the, the death of Christ or the resurrection of Christ, but the, the law was not done away with immediately upon the death and resurrection of Christ. Um, so if we have this period of the law, of course, it starts with Moses, 
but it doesn't end with the birth of Christ or the death of Christ or the resurrection of Christ. So, for example, Acts chapter 2, and Pakinatan, would you read verse 46, Acts, Acts chapter 2, verse 46? They continue daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So on the day of Pentecost here, or, or in Acts 2, um, we're told that they were still continuing daily with one accord in the temple. And, and what do you do in the temple? You offer animal sacrifices. And then chapter 3 in Acts, and Akun, would you read verse 1? Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. All right, and so again, we see Peter and John here going into the temple. And then uh, again in Acts chapter 3 and verse 3, it says, who's seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask and alms. And uh, we could look at many more verses and talk further about this, but it's clear that, again, the law did not end. And so that, that time under the law from Moses to Christ, that didn't end when he was born or when he died on the cross or when he rose again from the dead or even when he ascended into heaven. They still continued under the law after that. Okay, then go back to Romans 5. And so, again, there's, first of all, this period from Adam to Moses before the law. There was no law. And then in Romans 5.20, he talks about when the law entered. So when the law entered, did that improve man's condition? And on the contrary, Paul says in Romans 5.20, moreover. So beyond, beyond what has already been said, the law entered that the offense might abound. So the law did not stop sin or even reduce or diminish sin, but it made, made man's condition even worse. So the, the law did not stop it or slow down in any way, sin or death. But uh, again, it, it caused the offense to abound. Turn to... Uh, Look at look back at Romans chapter three. So, the law did not in any way whatsoever help man to be justified. Rather, it caused the offense to abound. Uh, Romans chapter three and verse twenty says, "Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight." for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So the law did nothing whatsoever to help man to be justified. It simply pointed out even more so that man was sinful. Um, so the, the law, the law brought, brought sin out into the open and clearly exposed it for what it was. Um, and not only that, but the law, as it says, it caused the offense to abound. So it actually caused an increase in sin when the law was given to Israel. So the, the, uh, the presence of the law actually stimulated sin in the nation of Israel rather than suppressing it. And there, there are, I think, many examples or illustrations that can help us understand this a bit. But one thing, if you think about, for example, those of you who are familiar a little bit with the, the history of the, the prohibition in the United States, and supposedly that was supposed to reduce or eliminate drunkenness and use of alcohol, but it, it didn't. It, that, that all, people still continue to drink alcohol and get drunk and, and so forth. But what it did is it made something that previously was legal, it now made it illegal. So it simply caused more people to be lawbreakers, but it didn't make them any better. 
It didn't reduce the problem that had already existed. There's, um, there's an old story that I've heard, um, no idea if it's true or not, but um, about a, uh, an older woman who in the church, she was complaining and objecting to the fact that they had posted the Ten Commandments on the wall. And so they, they were wondering, why in the world would you be against posting the Ten Commandments in, in the wall on the church in the on the church wall? And she she said, because it's going to put ideas in people's minds. And and there's something to that. When God gave the law and said, Don't do this, that made the Israelites want to do it even more. And when God said, You must do this that made the Israelites not want to do that. So um, there, there's, there's definitely uh, a number of illustrations or examples where we can see that we can understand that when the law entered, it caused the offense to abound. Uh, look in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Another example of that, Dan, is wet paint. Yeah. Yeah, that's an example that I've used a number of times when you're walking through a park and uh, if they have recently painted, put a fresh coat of paint on the benches, so they'll put a sign that says, wet paint, do not touch. So what does everyone do? They walk through and touching the bench to see if it's still wet. So you, you would never, it would never even enter your mind to walk through a park touching the benches. But when you see that sign, do not touch, now you're tempted to touch it. So that, that's another good uh, illustration of that. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 56 says, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. So the law according to this verse, does not stop sin or even reduce sin or weaken sin, but it gives strength to sin. Okay, then go back to Romans 5. So when the law, so we have from Adam to Moses, and then from Moses to Christ, the law entered, and what effect did that have? It caused the offense to abound. So no matter what sin, uh, then looking again in Romans chapter 5 and verse 20, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, as we've talked about. But then it says, but, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So Paul makes it clear in Romans 5 that no matter what sin we commit or how many times we sin, God's grace is more than ample to forgive our sins. So where, where uh, sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So the, the foundation of our lives as believers, again, um, as Paul makes clear in Romans 5, is to know what we have in Christ. So if you go back to the beginning of chapter 5 again, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by, also, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And then he continues to go through chapter 5 and tell us that we have even more. There's, there's still more that we have as you read through the chapter. Um, and then, as we have seen, in uh, then in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, the next thing then is to realize that we will have tribulations in this life, but we can glory in those tribulations. And then in verses 6 to 11, um, he tells us that we should continually dwell upon the amazing love of Christ and, and all that we have in him. And then verses 12 through 14, he tells us why sin and death exist. Where, where did it begin and why do sin and death exist? And then uh, in the rest of the chapter, verses 15 through 21, he tells us that we can know 
that the cross of Christ and the grace of God are much greater than Adam's offense and much greater than the law, and much greater than our sin. And so, uh, and again, looking at Romans chapter 5 and verse 20, and, and next week we'll uh, talk a bit about verse 21. Um, so whatever sin problem we have, Romans 5, and, and especially if we look at verses 20 and 21, make it clear that God's grace is sufficient, and in fact, more than sufficient. All right, we will stop there for today, and again, next week we'll uh, just talk a little bit about Romans 5, 21, and then go on. Thank you all. Thank you, Dan. Good night, everyone. Good morning.